All right, uh, this morning we are going to wrap up uh, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Uh, next week, the week after, we'll finish all of the rest of Romans 1. So we, we won't be going as meticulous and as slow, but these are just, this right here, verses 16 and 17, so much reveal um, or, or so packed with theology and packed solid with just a lot of what's going on in Romans all together. So, uh, and also I want to right up front let you know, uh, you know, as I was just sharing with everyone that yesterday we helped my son move and, uh, and we're all sore and exhausted. So um, I will do my very best this morning and just praying that everything will be in the spirit, obviously, and because the body is, the mind and body's willing, but I'm not sure if it's capable <laughs> this morning. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time, and Lord Jesus, we, we come to you in the precious name, in your precious and holy name, Lord, and we, we thank you for, for all that you've done for us. And Lord, now we, we ask God for your blessing. We ask God for your Holy Spirit to be poured out on us. We ask, Lord, that you will reveal to us your word and what you want us to know and, and, and learn from this morning. And I pray, Lord, I know for my family, many of them are just tired and exhausted and and it was a, a beautiful spring weekend, and a lot of people here worked and did things. And Lord, I just pray that you will, to your spirit will take over, Lord God, and just minister to our heart, soul, and minds, and allow us to, to leave here today receiving every ounce of, of, of your love and of your wisdom, of your word, of your truth, Lord God, that you would have for us. And so we are just so dependent upon you this day, and we ask all of these things in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh, again, Romans 1, 14 uh, through 19 is what we read two weeks ago. Last week was Resurrection Weekend, so we, we, we paused. And, and some of what was taught last week, we'll deal with this this week as well, so I'm not going to repeat some of that. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and read Romans 1, starting in 14 to get the full context here. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to the unwise, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for all who believe. For the first, the Jew, and for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because we, because what may be known of God is manifested in them for God has shown it to them. And then obviously Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4, I'm just going to read 4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. A few weeks ago, as we taught, we preached through the first part of uh, Romans 6, 1, 16, and I think one of the main points out of that real quick is that, is that the gospel, that Paul's not ashamed of the gospel, he's not afraid to share the gospel, and he also realizes that and big part of that is the fact that God's not going to let him down. Where the gospel is preached, God is there, the Holy Spirit is there, and the power is from God for salvation. It's not Paul. The power comes from God for salvation to everyone who believes. It is uh, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. It is the Holy Spirit that moves in the heart, that, that stirs the faith, that stirs this up and brings us this understanding. It is, it is the work of God that changes our heart of stone to a heart of flesh so that we can and do believe in him. And so that is all that work. And so God, Paul realizing there's nothing to be ashamed of, there's nothing to be afraid of, and preaching the gospel because all the work is the Holy Spirit and God. And as long as the preacher is sent, which we'll, he will talk about in Romans as well, how else will they hear unless somebody is sent? But this week, let's move into verse, really focus more into verse 17. Uh, Paul clearly puts some favor here, um, you know, uh, on on just the overwhelming, well, I shouldn't say favor, that is a weak word. Paul puts all uh, glory to God, all effort to God, all dependence upon God and everything through these two verses. So um, 
But we see this, um, you know, if you look at the fact that everything's, you had the Jew first and the Greek, and then the Greek, but it's now introduced to the Greek. And for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So in the gospel and in the power of God through salvation, righteousness is revealed. Again, first the Jew, which we talked about, but also for the Greek. And the point is, is that we see even with Peter, with his dream of the, the, the unclean food coming down and Jesus saying, take and eat, take and eat. And, 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 and that brought Paul to the, I mean, Peter to the realization as people in Joppa came knocking on the door and then brought him to Cornelius' home. And then, and then Cornelius and being Jew, I mean, being Gentile, uh, a Roman centurion, everything, the spirit falls on them. They all come to believe in salvation. The household becomes Christian, to say it that way. And so Peter comes back and is able to report, hey, I, I, the God gave me this dream that, that th you know, the reality is, you know, and, and a lot of times I keep saying things change, that things have changed. And what the Lord spoke in my heart in prayer, prayer for this sermon, and you know, because people will say, well, no, I've got the law and everything God has. No, God does not change what God's done through Peter, just like it is. And what he's doing to us is he's revealing his salvation plan. Part of that salvation plan is the period of the law, but that's not the end of it. There is a revelation that God brings forth in his over eternal plan from the very beginning. And so something hasn't changed here, but what has been happened is revealed. And so it was revealed to Peter. Peter comes back and reports, guys, I, God gave me this dream. I obeyed. I, I followed these men. I went into a Gentile's home. You know, I'm, I didn't die. Um, and I went into this Gentile home. I shared the gospel and they all, and the Holy Spirit fell on them. You know, what do we, and what do we do? We can't deny this. We can't deny this. And so all of this took place pointing back to Abraham, pointing back even to Habakkuk, but pointing back to Abraham that the just shall be, uh, or the justified, the righteous is all by faith. And I think that's very essential. And I want especially my children to understand this. I think it's so critical, but I, you know, obviously I want everyone, but is the reality is that the covenant of Abraham precedes the covenant of Moses the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant is the law that was given on Mount Sinai. But you've got to realize that from, and, and, and that's why I'm saying, I, I really appreciate the Holy Spirit ministering to me this morning as I'm going through this, is that the Abrahamic, or the, the, the Abrahamic covenant was all about faith. Then the circumcision took place after the faith as a sign of the covenant of faith. And that covenant precedes the Mosaic covenant, the law. The law is a portion in history of the overall plan of salvation. Nothing changed from Noah's covenant to Abraham's covenant or to Mosaic covenant. And I want you to hear this very, very clearly. I think this really blessed me. It wasn't like God said, oh, I'm making a covenant with Noah. Oh, eh, I forgot something. I need to make something with Abraham. Well, this faith thing isn't working out. So let me make a covenant with Mo Moses and give a law. Well, man, that's not working out. Well, I got to get rid of the law and change something. I'm gonna, hey, Jesus, come here. Let's go. No, all of this was planned before the foundation of the world. These different covenants, this, different, this is all where we live today in, 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 in the covenant of grace is all part of the plan. And God has just revealed different parts of this to us through time. And so I hope that helps you as we go through the rest of this morning. So let's look at a few facts here. These are very, very quick facts. Um, the Greek word for righteousness comes in a noun and a verb. The noun verb would be righteousness. Excuse me, the noun verb. The noun would be righteousness. The verb would be justification or justified all right um the and so the word for righteousness here dikaiosune is used 34 times in the book of romans compared to 24 times in all of paul's letters combined outside of romans he's going to hammer on righteousness 
for a very key purpose because he's dealing with the falseness, the false understanding that righteousness comes to the law and that justification comes to the law. He uses, he uses the, the verb version of it in Romans 15 times as justified. So that's a lot. That's a phenomenal amount. Um, the word uh, means uh, for righteousness, the, the, the DK asune is integrity, virtue, purity of life, righteousness, correctness of thinking and feeling and acting. Right? So that kind of covers everything you could imagine about the rightness of everything. So in the, the, so in the power of the gospel and salvation, we find the righteousness of God. How do we find the righteousness of God? And I pray that I can do justice in explaining this. And I pray the Holy Spirit will, will open your ears and your mind to this. And, 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 and again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this this morning because I spent a, a lot of time last week on Resurrection Sunday talking about the fact that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel and proof that it, because when man sin, there is a penalty that must be paid. That penalty is, <coughs> the, is blood. There must be a sacrifice. There, God required a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, for, for getting yourself back in a right relationship with him so that you could spend time with him. Um, and, um, oh, I'm not going to go there today, but that sermon you sent, is what Dr. Piper said in there was just amazing. Maybe I'll go to that today, but it was really, really, really amazing. But the reality is, is that the... Um, is that there is a punishment, there is a wrath, there is a hatred of sin by God, and he is going to punish all people in the history of the world that have not come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And, and, there's, and I'm not going to get into all that theology today, but there, there's Abraham's justified by faith just as we are justified by faith. But those who live by the law, as it says, again, will perish by the law. It's very clearly taught in Scripture. And so here we see that the righteousness of God being revealed in the gospel and the salvation is, is again, here I'm going to try to say this, sum it up in one sentence now. God is right. God is right to make rules. God is right to require us to live by those rules. And when we disobey those rules, God is right in punishing us for disobeying his rules. Okay? So therefore, for him to remain righteous, he must discipline. He must punish. How does that relate to us? If we say to one of our little children... You know, if you do that again, this is what's going to happen. And when they do it again, you to remain righteous, to remain right, to remain in authority, to remain there, you must do what you said you were going to do. If you don't, what happens? The child says, wow, that's why I'm just keep on right on doing this. I just keep right on doing this because there's no punishment. I just keep doing what I want to do. There's no discipline. There's no action taking place. And then there's zero respect, zero honor of the authority. Eventually what happens? I mean, and so that's what happens here with God. So God must keep his word. He must keep his promise. That's what makes him righteous. And so what does he do? He reveals his righteousness through Christ to come and take the penalty for us all to take that punishment, to take that discipline, to put, become our sin, as I read in 2 Corinthians 5. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might receive the righteousness of God, might become the righteousness of God. And so that's what takes place here. Whoa. Uh, I hit a button here and my, word, my letter just went <laughs> on my computer. Uh, my eyes are not that bad. So, so think about this. As we go through this, um, and we look at this, the power of this righteousness is beyond our thoughts. It's hard for people to comprehend what is being said here. The Jewish people are, dis, are disdained at this thought that, that 
the Gentiles, that anybody, even them, can be justified by faith alone. It's, 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 it's very difficult. They despise it. They condemn this. This was the anger. This was the anger. With how can he forgive people of their sins? How can he do this? How can he do this? Does, does he not know this woman? I mean, they bring her, does he not know this woman is an adulterer? How can he forgive her sins? She should be stoned to death. The law says to stone her to death. So is God righteous in telling her, go and sin no more, your sins are forgiven? Is Jesus righteous in doing that when the law demanded this penalty? Is he? Think about that. Think logically through this. Absolutely he is righteous and just in telling her to go sin no more and not stoning her to death because Jesus is going to take her adultery on himself. He's going to pay that price. All right? There is this bitterness in the heart of the Jewish people, of those that are keeping the law, questioning how can a Gentile receive salvation and be justified and made righteous without ever having the law to begin with. I mean, think about it. These people are sitting here for thousands of years, keepers of the law, entrusted with the law, interpreting the law, and saying, wait a minute, Jesus, you're telling me you're the son of God. You're Jewish. Because Jesus was Jewish. And you get to, you got to add that in. Jesus was Jewish. And you're telling us as a Jewish man and you're claiming to be the son of God, that the rest of this world out here that's never had the law given to them, that they can be justified, they can be made righteous, and they can receive eternal salvation. They can become children of God? No, we're the children of God. They can't become the children of God. No, you're wrong. We hate you, Jesus. That's, this is where this is coming from. They've had the power They've had the authority. They've been the representatives of God, Yahweh, on the earth. And now you're telling me these Gentiles can become this thing? I mean, think about this. How can they? This is the Gentiles' argument. How can They must have the law. You must keep the law. They have to keep the law. This is the argument taking place in Acts 15. With the Judaizers, they couldn't get their heads wrapped around this. They, they'd say they must be circumcised. They, they, they have to keep the law. It's not fair. It's not right. We have spent these centuries doing this. How can this be right? Well, they were blinded. They didn't understand the law. They didn't understand the law. They didn't understand the purpose of the law. In the, that's why I said earlier, they didn't understand the purpose of the law. That in the eternalness of salvation there's a segment in time and history that this law was put in they didn't understand it they didn't understand the prophets and then also they realized that Gentiles were really an abomination they couldn't even be in their households they couldn't eat with them and then there was this process that they had to go through to become Jewish but just think about this. Here you got Matthew 23, 15. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. What Jesus is saying to them right here, this is where the Jewish people would go and make a proselyte. What a proselyte means is that they come to a Gentile and share about God, and they say, Wow, I want to believe in God. And so great, then to believe in God and become a child of God and to be righteous and to be justified, you have to, you have to go through this process. We're going to teach you the law. You have to start keeping the law. And if you're a man, once you've kept the law, you must be circumcised. Now here's, here's what, in studying and reading through that, is that different synagogues or groups of synagogues had different rules for how a Gentile can become a proselyte or become, become Jewish, if I can say that way. And so this group over here in this part would have these rules. Well, this group over here would have rules, but they wouldn't accept these rules. So if somebody became a proselyte over here, became a Jewish believer over here, this group over here may not believe. They may consider them still Gentile. I mean, this, this is man's rules. This is man. 
And so here was three things that required, even today, these same basic three rules are in place, or four, is they have to learn the Talmud. They have to learn the law and understand the law and begin to keep the law. If you're a man, you must be circumcised. And then they're immersed three times, <laughs> both men and women. They go and take full baptism. And then they are to offer a certain sacrifice, korban. They have to, they have to offer korban in the temple. But since the temple is not there, they are deferring their sacrifice until the temple is built. So those that die and the temple's not built and they can't sacrifice the altar, I don't get I don't know how they get around that. But now they're proselytes, they're Jewish, they're part of the Jewish believing. These aren't the God fearers that I referred to, but the Jewish believing. So this is where they're 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 up to. And so if they did not covet convert to Judaism, if they did not convert to Judaism, they are not considered worthy to be in a personal relationship with God. They're not worthy to be close friends, Jewish people. They're not worthy to even to marry. There's a lot of, lot of issues that take place in a, in a Jewish family when they, a girl or a boy wants to marry a Gentile. Many believe that Gentiles are evil and only deserve eternal death. Now you, Paul, you're saying that all they have to do is believe in Jesus, who most of the Jewish people reject anyway, and that's it? They just have to believe in Jesus? The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. Then the logical step would then be for the Jewish person or non-believer or anyone else at this point, if this is true, it, and, and, and hear me loud and clear, and then I pray the Holy Spirit will fix whatever I'm about to say. The logical step then would be, if this is true, if all somebody's got to do is believe in Jesus Christ and they will be made righteous, holy, and justified and receive eternal life, no matter who it is, then God's not just. He is not righteous because this is wrong. And now can you see the departure in the Jewish community from the law, from God? This cannot be true. So then Paul is wrong. And, if, and Jesus is wrong. And this really begins to ring true throughout all the church, from the Catholics to Orthodox to the fundamentalists. Why? Why? And, and hear me loud and clear. Why does this begin to reign true in the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church and the fundamentalist church and any other church? It's because we see this idea of doing rules in every religion in the world. This separates us as Christians. This separates us from all other religions. This separates us from all, really, denominations. Is there's this idea that you must be doing rules, you must be performing such and such in order to please God, bless God, receive favor from God, receive love from God, receive goodness from God, to prove your salvation. I want y'all to please think on that. The idea of works, again, has been, I mean, every religion. I mean, the Hindus, the Buddhists are unbelievable. Jesus blows this entire idea out of water. This whole concept of men in their effort somehow rising to a level in their effort of obedience of pleasing and re receiving favor from God or a little God. Is that not human nature? Is that not what, again, the evil one did in the garden? That's absolutely what the evil one did in the garden. 
What have I said? The greatest evil, the greatest, what is sin? Sin and evil is desiring what in your own heart what you want more than what God wants. Again, that is the, com- the, the number one commandment in the Satanic Bible. Just do what you want to do. Make it yourself. So coming to God, coming to Jesus, coming to redemption, coming to salvation becomes somehow, some way, even just a smidget that's in your heart that is a work, that's something that you're trying to do in your own heart, in your own effort, is man. And it smacks of idolatry. It's, it, 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 in other words, it's, it, it's, it comes across it is, is I've, God owes me. I mean, this is exactly what Paul is going to do, and I don't want to steal the thunder. We're going to get to a point here real soon where Paul says, if it is works, if it is works, then there is a waged, a wage owed. And so, if there's anything in us, in any form or fashion that we're doing as a work, then we can, then technically, we get to stand before God and said, "I did such and such; therefore, you owe me." That's what it ultimately comes down to. And people say, "No, no, no, no I'm not there. I'm not, that's not me." No, I'm telling you. You, be real, be honest with yourself, search your heart, have the Holy Spirit search your heart and reveal your heart. This is what's taking place. Don't forget that there is these other total misconceptions as well, that the law is done and not good and I'm under grace, which is just the opposite. And, and this is not true. Paul will deal with both sides of this equation through Romans. I want you to be very clear, though, that if you are really born again, then Jesus lives in you and the Holy Spirit is within you. And through, your, and through his death on the cross and your death on the cross in him, it is the working power of Christ in you that will change your life. Not you. Not you at all. And we'll get there. Right now, we're dealing with the fundamentalness of faith and belief, not sanctification or living by the Spirit. We're going to get there. God is good and only does what is good. So you must understand his righteousness and his justice comes out of his goodness, out of his love. God is love and only does that which is loving. He is right and only does that which is right. God is righteous and a righteous judge. And he is holy. If he did anything else opposite of any of this, he wouldn't be holy. He wouldn't be righteous, which goes back to that question I asked to say, that logical process in the, in the human brain. But the fact that he is good, that he is loving, that he is merciful, that he is righteous, then this being part of his eternal plan is right. That it is good what he has done in and through Jesus Christ. And also remember, God is unchanging. He cannot change. This means he, everything that we're talking about today, again, was all part of the eternal plan. This means the truth of faith alone is God's perfect will. Do you understand that? Let me say it again. This means the truth and the fact that we are justified by faith alone in Christ Jesus is God's perfect will. This means that what Paul is writing and teaching in Romans is God's perfect will. It's God's perfect plan. It's God's perfect design. It is God's desire from the foundation of the world. And again, I pray the Holy Spirit opens every one of our eyes to this, our hearts. God is perfect. He cannot change. He is pure, good, caring, loving, merciful, gracious, faithful. All of this is unchanging. Therefore, his plan for eternal life is unchanging. Last week for Resurrection Sunday, we talked about the following. Again, that God's righteousness requires sin to be punished. Let's look at this. I want to read Leviticus 19 to you. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Right there, we just all failed. 
right out of the, the very first thing. You should all be holy. This is what the Jewish person's thinking. I must be holy. So I've got to interpret the law and come up with all these rules and verbal laws and verbal things of what's holy. And so what's holy is I'm not supposed to do any work on Sabbath, so I can only walk so far on the Sabbath. I can only do such and such on the Sabbath, and if I do anything else, then I'm no longer holy. So they come up with all these rules and ways to what? To keep the Sabbath. And we'll get to a point where we'll talk about that because Jesus says, you Pharisees and Sadducees, you don't understand. Jesus, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, and my disciples are hungry, and so they're eating. Because they'd made a rule you couldn't pluck grain. But we'll get to all that. Speak to all the congregation of children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father and keep my Sabbath. I am the Lord your God. So what does it mean that every one of you should revere his mother and his father? Then he says, Keep my Sabbath. What does that mean? Well, I've failed there. We're just in two verses now, and I've already failed. Keeping the Sabbath, I failed. And I don't even know how to keep the Sabbath because of all these rules the Jewish people have made. I don't even know what's right and what's wrong. How do I really keep the Sabbath that pleases God? Do I stay in the bed all day and rest? Do I get up at, as soon as the sun breaks and, and just play guitar and worship him all day long? How do I please him on the Sabbath? Tell me. How do I revere my mother and father? And I'm 53 years old now. How do I revere my dad? Well, man must get in there and interpret that, right? Man must come up with some rules so I can be holy. Do not turn to idols, nor make for yourselves molded gods. I am the Lord your God. And if you offer a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it of your own free will. Hmm. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it, and, and on the next day, and if it if any of it remains until the third day, it shall be burned in the fire. And if it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an abomination. It shall not be accepted. Therefore, everyone who eats, it shall bear his iniquity because he has profaned the hallowed offering of the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from his people. Well, I'm just failing everywhere. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not glean your vineyards, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Well, how do I do that in my garden? I don't have any poor people around me, and I don't have strangers. Do I, I guess I call my neighbors up and say, hey, we didn't pick everything. And I'm not trying to be sarcastic, please. I'm not trying to do that. But I'm saying, how do I do this? Because I want to please God. Uh, you shall not cheat, excuse me, I'm sorry. You shall not steal, nor deal falsities, nor lie to one another. Well, I failed there. You shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of, of your God. I am your Lord. Well, I failed there. You shall not cheat your neighbor, nor rob him. I probably did that as a kid, so I have failed there. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you, all night until morning. So I think we all fail that because now people get paid weekly or bi-weekly or once a month. I'm not sure how we do that. You shall not curse the death nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear the Lord. I am the Lord your God. I don't think I've ever done that. I'm good there. Uh, you shall not do injustice in judgment. Lord knows how many times I've, I've disciplined my children out of anger. So yes, I've failed here. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go about as a talebearer among the people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. So I've never taken a stand against the life of my neighbor, but I've been a talebearer. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall not rebuke your neighbor, nor bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. 
You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your livestock breed with another kind. You shall not sow your fields with mixed seed, nor shall a garment of mixed linen or wool come upon you. Well, there's that one right there is something we do. We, we found that, that uh, by wearing mixed garments that our, our skin and our family, maybe it's genetic, breaks out. But when we, we wear pure, our skin doesn't break out. We don't get rashes. Uh, whoever lies carnally with a woman who is betrothed to a man is a concubine and who has not at all been redeemed nor given her freedom for this shall be scourging shall be a scourging but then and they shall not be put to death because she was not free um, or they shall yeah and he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord to the door of the tabernacle of meeting a ram as a trespass offering the priest shall make atonement <clears throat> for him with a ram of the trespass offering before the Lord for his sin which he has committed and the sin which he has committed shall be given, forgiven him. When you come into the land and have planted all kinds of trees for fruit, food, then you shall count the fruit as uncircumcised. Three years it shall be uncircumcised to you, you shall not eat it. But in the fourth year all of its fruit shall be holy and praise to the Lord. And in the fifth year you shall eat the fruit that it may yield to you its increase. I am the Lord your God. How many people plant a fruit tree in their yard and wait till the fifth year to eat any fruit from it? Well, we did that. Uh, except maybe the blueberries. Okay. You shall not eat anything with blood, nor shall you practice deviation or soothsaying. You shall not shave around the sides of your, your head, nor shall you disfigure the edges of your beard. Uh, somebody I know recently was just having this discussion with a group of people that wear beards and they were trying to keep the law and they're trying to say that you can't use uh, a razor, but you can use a trimmer because a trimmer is not a razor. I'm like, what's the spirit of this? You, you guys, I mean, that, that's what the Pharisees and saying. I'm not trying to make fun of them. I know in their hearts they're trying to please God. They're trying to to live righteously. They're trying to do something. But when I sit here and logically think about it, they're doing no different than the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. Um, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am the Lord. People right now in the church, lots of people getting tattoos and saying, well, that's not what that word means. It's the same logic the homosexuals say, well, no, that's not what the word homosexual means. <laughs> You know, do not prostitute your daughters to cause her to be a harlot, lest the land fall into harlotry and the land becomes full of wickedness. Well, I've done, I'm good there. You shall not, you shall keep my Sabbaths and revere my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Give no regard, I mean sanctuary, so we don't, let me think about how do you revere the sanctuary? Well, it's not in existence, but how does that apply principally or, or spirit in a spirit sense? And this, what's the spirit of the law here in church, in a church building? Right. Um, give no regard to mediums or familiar spirits. Do not seek after them. Do not be defiled by them. I'm the Lord your God. You shall raise before you shall raise before the gray haired headed and honor the presence of the old man and fear your God. I am the Lord your God. You know, this is one where we've taught our children. If you if you're sitting in say you're at a funeral, you're at a wedding or you're at some big thing and you're sitting in a chair and then two gray haired, uh, you know, 70-year-old, 70, 65-year-old 70 man and, and woman walk in and their hair is gray and stuff. What do you do if there's no seats available? You get up and you give them the seat. You honor. All right? These are the things that we've taught. And if a stranger dwells within your land, you shall not mistreat him. Well, this scripture right here has a lot of bearing where we are today with uh, our whole concept of uh, what's going on with the uh, people coming across the border. That's, that's a, a deep subject. The stranger who dwells among you shall be as you, as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were a stranger in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. That's a tough one. You shall not do injustice in judgment and measurement of length, weights, or volumes. No cheating at games. Uh, you shall have honest scales, honest weights, and honest Ephraim, and honest hen. I am the Lord your God. You you brought, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe my statutes and all my judgments and perform them. I am the Lord. 
That's 37 verses out of, out of a whole book on rules and laws in Leviticus. Now I'm telling you, I've, I read this on purpose and there's more I could read. For example, um, well, I won't do that. But just think about this. You got to do all of that as God intended, not as you interpret, as God intended to be righteous. All of it. Because there's not much in here other than the sacrifice part. That, I mean, and just all of it. And then we go to Matthew 5, 27. You have heard it was said of those old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Guys, there's no hope. You can't keep the law. You can't please God through the law. You can't. So what hope is there? The reality is that God knew that in the end, no one at all could ever be justified by the law and keeping the law or keep the law. The only way one has any hope in being justified as a result of the law is the fact that the law is there for the purpose. The only way you can be just, I'm going to say this, the only way you can be justified by the law is the purpose of the law. What is the purpose of the law? To tutor you, to show you your sin so that you realize that you aren't holy, you aren't righteous, and yet you cry out to God for mercy and, and grace and say, God, help me. We can't do that. Uh, Jeff just read Leviticus. There's no way. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Help me, help me, help me. Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. I'm sending my only son because I love you. He will take all of your sin on. He will do this. That is your only hope. The purpose of the law is to reveal sin in us. The purpose of the law is to reveal the holiness of God, his character, his nature, and to show us the gap between us and him. And that Jesus brings the gap to fullness to where we are one, we are his children. So for God to fully justify someone is righteous, then all the sins must be purged, cleansed, and removed. That's what Jesus did. Those under the law who live by the law, therefore, will be justified the law. Let's read what Galatians 3 says. Verse 22. But the scripture has confirmed all are under sin, that the promise of that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterwards be revealed. In other words, the law kept us in this place until the law, until faith was revealed in Jesus. The law was there to keep us until faith was revealed in Jesus. Say it again so you don't misunderstand. Everybody says, well, no, the law is still for today, or no, the law is done. The law kept us under guard until a time would come in history that Jesus would do what he did. Law brings us to a point in history, a part of the salvation process, until faith is revealed. Once faith is revealed, what happens? Verse 24, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith, not justified by the law. The law was used as our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith, not the law. But after faith has come, we no long, we're no longer under the tutor. Let me read this again in this way. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith because after faith has come, after Jesus has come, we are no longer under a law. I'm not saying this. This is what God's word is saying. We are no longer under a law because the law has served its purpose to bring us to saving faith in Jesus Christ. So then what is, the, what is the human brain saying? Oh, there's no longer a law. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> no, you can't. Read the rest of Galatians. You're now a slave to the Spirit. You're, under the, you're either a slave to the law or a slave to the Spirit. You're under the Spirit. You're under the 
Christ is in you now. You can't do whatever you want, but now you don't have to do it in your own effort. You do it by faith. Believe in faith that Jesus is going to change you. Jesus is going to make you the person he intended you to be. This is why he says, I'm going to come and put my law on your heart. You obviously can't, you know, I'm not trying to put words in God's mouth or be sarcastic in here. I'm just going to say, you can't keep the law in your brain. You can't keep it because I wrote it and gave it to you. Now I'm going to have to put it in your heart. That's his plan, has been his plan ever since. If we do not think it out loud in our heads or verbalize it, okay, so if you're not thinking this out loud in your head, now you're having a conversation in your head, or we verbalize it without physically verbal it so others can see it, deep inside of us, here's the problem, here's what I was talking about earlier, deep inside of us, every person will say, but God, you do not know, you don't understand what I've done. This is the problem. I want you all to hear this. I want you to focus on me, stare at me, and hear what I'm about to say. This is what's taking place deep inside of our flesh and our heart if you've not come to the full understanding of your death on the cross. If you've not come to the full acceptance of Jesus' love for you, if you have not come and found your acceptance in Christ and Christ alone, here's what's going on in your heart. Somewhere, even if it's a little bit, God, you don't understand what I've done. How can you truly forgive me? How I don't deserve this free gift. I don't deserve this grace. I don't deserve your love. I have done something that, that, that Christ did not deal with on the cross. I, I don't deserve this. This is the problem. This is the lie from Satan. This is what's ultimately going on. This is why people keep coming back to a law. This is why they keep coming back to some type of rule. This is how they keep coming back with all these lists of what they have to do in church to look Christian, to be Christian, to talk Christian. Is that's what's going on in the heart. Instead of, I'm done. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm impure. Jesus, now, take me. I'm nailed to the cross. I'm born again. I'm a new creation. I'm now holy. And your love is amazing, God. Your goodness is awesome. I praise you. I worship you. Your love is awesome. I now believe in that by faith. I believe that your love is all I need. I believe your goodness is all I need. I believe that you are all I need. And I want to love you. I want to follow you. Do with me as you will. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You know, and this is even true as a side note of people that have been abused and are true victims. Maybe they've been beat up by husbands or, or actually have come out of sex trafficking. They, they don't believe they deserve God's law and they've done nothing wrong. They were forced into something as a slave. It is so hard to let go and just believe in faith. It is so hard just to believe by faith. By the way, believing in faith is an act as well. Do you ever think about that? Obedience in faith. That's all he asks us to do, just believe. You have one rule now, believe. It's one rule, believe. And Jesus knows we can't even keep that one rule. That's why he sends the Holy Spirit inside of us. I'm sending you a helper because you can't even believe. You can't even have faith. I'm going to send you the helper. And I'm going to be the author of your faith. And I'm going to bring things in your life that are going to build your faith. There's going to be testimony. There's going to be miracles. Is, I'm going to open the word of God up to you. And when you read it, you're going to understand things you never understood before. And I'm going to bring people around you. And you're going to sing songs. And in singing these songs, I'm going to have people write the most amazing words. And all of this is going to build your faith. You're going to have trials and struggles in life. And I'm going to see you through them. I'm going to build your faith. And I'm going to bless you with miracles. And I'm going to build your faith. And I'm going to speak in your heart. 
I'm going to speak to you and I'm going to build your faith and you're going to know me. It is, it's just crazy. It's so crazy the trap we've all fallen into. It's just so hard to believe, but this is one that Jesus is the one that empowers us by the word of the Holy Spirit. It is so hard to just do nothing, isn't it? Especially Americans. It is so hard just to do nothing. It's just crazy. But to wait, to faithfully wait for God to work his salvation out in you, for faithfully, to faithfully wait for God to make you into Christ, to change you. And it's so hard to wait for the meaning of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 to be poured into your heart and become application in your life. It is by faith and faith alone. So Romans 1.17 says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written. Now, I want to read this in light of everything I just said, and I hope that the Lord and the Holy Spirit will help this to bring power to you and revelation to you you've never seen before, starting in Galatians 3.1. O oh, foolish Galatians, O oh, foolish Christian, O oh, foolish American, O oh, foolish churchgoer, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? He's asking the question, O oh, foolish human being person, who has deceived you, who has lied to you, who has convinced you not to obey the truth of faith in Christ alone? Verse 2, this only I want to learn from you. And I ask you all, I ask anybody in here, I ask myself, my own heart. I want you to ask deep in your heart. Don't, don't, don't play games here. Ask your own heart. Think through this. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. This I only learned of you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Where did the Spirit, where did the salvation come from? Where did it really, where did it come from? From works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, having come, begun in Christ, having begun through that, you are now being made perfect by the flesh? He's asking a question. You are, if you, are you so foolish that somehow, some way, that you think that having begun by faith alone and salvation in Christ, that now you're going to be made perfect by doing something in the law? Are you that foolish? What he's basically saying here, if that's your attitude, if that's the direction you're going, then Christ died in vain. You don't need Jesus. Go on. Be foolish and figure it out yourself. That's what's going on here. Because he says right here in verse 4, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you, the Helper, works miracles among you, does he do it? by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Does Jesus, here's what he's asking you, does God perform miracles in your life because you're doing good? Does he perform miracles in your life because you're obedient? Does he perform miracles in your life because you're obeying the law? Or does he perform miracles in your life because of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. What do you think the Jewish people thought of that statement? We're sons of Abraham. No, 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 you're not sons of Abraham. Only those of faith are sons of Abraham. And there were some faithful Jewish people. Absolutely. Especially those two that were waiting for Jesus to be brought to the temple to be circumcised. And the, in verse 8, in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. 
For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, this is what, if you want to do works, here's what, here's what scripture says. Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law and do them. If you don't do them all, you are cursed. I don't care who you are, you're cursed. But that no one is justified by the law and the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith, quoting the same thing that he writes here in Romans 1, Habakkuk 4. Excuse me, Habakkuk. Yeah. Verse 12, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ, listen to this. Hold on, don't go anywhere. Listen to the scripture. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So listen to what this is saying. You got to look at this in context. In verse 10, it says, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things of the law. All right. So you, it's the law. He's saying here, Jesus has now redeemed us from this law. That may, that may, that may rub against anything, things you've been taught and learned. But what does redeemed from mean? What does it mean? I got to keep the law? I still got to keep the law. No, you're redeemed from it. You've been purchased from it. You've been bought from it. Okay? You can go now. Why were we redeemed from it? Verse 14, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Hear that? You can't receive the promise of the Spirit and the law. The Spirit dwelling in you comes from the promise of faith. If you're going to keep the law, then it becomes a work of the flesh, not a work of the Spirit. You've been redeemed from that. You don't have to try anymore. You don't have to make an effort anymore. And James 2, 8 says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the description, you shall love your neighbors yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality and you commit sin and are convicted by the law as the transgressor, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all the law. Do you, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you have become a transgressor of all the law. So speak. So do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment without mercy to the one who has shown mercy, because mercy trumps, triumphs over judgment. This is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, James 2, 8, 13. Mercy triumphs judgment. Come to me with your law. Come to me with your rule. And I will say, fine, that rule is a judgment. I'm going to tell you mercy trumps that law every time love your neighbor as yourself trumps obedience to a law so let's finish up we're nearly done here faith to faith for in righteousness of god is revealed from faith to faith this has multiple meanings here Righteousness is given and gained based on the faithfulness of Christ first and foremost. So from the faithfulness of Christ to our faith. So from the faithfulness to Christ to our faith. This also means that we're moving from the faith in the law to faith in Christ. We're moving from faith in the law to faith in Christ. This also means our faith that brought us redemption will now bring us to holy living. So our faith that brought us our redemption, that we believe in our redemption, now brings us to holy living. 
It also means from faith, we are now going to be brought into a deeper faith. Faith, we're coming from a basic childlike faith and being brought into a deeper faith, which is actually a childlike faith. This also has a deep meaning that, the, that this is now being brought from the faith of Jews to the Israelites to the faith of everyone. The faith of the Israelites now to faith of everyone. This is what's happening here when he writes, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And then he ends up quoting again Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. And I read that at the beginning. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by his faith, depending on your version. Habakkuk 2.4 is God's responding to Habakkuk complaining for God's inaction and injustice. This is the same thing the Pharisees are doing through this whole thing. The Judaizers are doing. It's what they're fighting. They're saying Paul is, is wrong. Who is the just and the righteous one here in Habakkuk? Who is it? The one who lives by faith. See, even the Old Testament law is, and the prophets are full of the reality of pointing to the future time when we're all justified by faith, not works. It's scattered throughout it. I'm not going to take the time to go through them all this morning. It's all pointing there if we would just not be blind. We see it. I mean, you know, why was David loved? His faithfulness. Who is the just and righteous one here in Habakkuk? Again, the one who lives by faith. The one who trusts in God. The one who looks to God to produce righteousness in them. That's who it is. Notice also Paul and Habakkuk also tie living to faith. The word living to faith. Paul's talking about you're living by faith. Not just believe in your, your life. You get up in the morning, you live by faith. You go through the day living by faith. This is how one shall live. Not to be the law of works, but the law of faith. The Jews miss this over and over in the Old Testament and obviously in the New Testament. There was, there was a surprising true coming of justification and salvation through the redemption plan of God that they did not see. The righteous person is no longer an Israelite who keeps the law and is called to live out their covenant identity, therefore achieving eternal life. No, God's plan was further revealed. As a serial, I'm not saying God changed his mind or there was a change. It's just further revealing of God's ultimate plan. Now, anyone on, who is on earth who comes with a redeeming faith in Jesus Christ is the one who is righteous and justified and now has eternal life, and more so as a true child of God. They've been adopted. <coughs> God's people, God's people have been redefined in human understanding and in human history. But not in God's understanding of history. What I mean, what I'm trying to say there is that, is that righteousness, justification, eternal life, all this, God's people, his Christian, the Christian people, the people that believe in him, may be redefined in human history, in the human mind, but in God's it's never been. It's always been his plan. It has just been revealed now in Christ. And please pray that God will help you to see this, that he, that he has a plan, and this has been God's plan from the very beginning. Not the law, but faith in Jesus based on the faithfulness of Christ in God, not us. And so I will close with that this morning. And I hope you've been blessed by it, but it, I hope this has helped you this morning because it, it's, we're going to get to a place, though, where this is going to get very deep theologically, very deep. This isn't deep yet. This is nowhere near deep yet. But we got to come to a place where we're living our life by faith and faith alone. And I think once we all get there, we're going to see a transformation take place in our hearts 
in the way we behave, the way we talk, the way we do, because it's, 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 it's just awesome. It's awesome what Christ does through the power of the resurrection. So, as a reminder, let's go ahead. I'm just going to read these two verses again. Verse Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Just think about salvation from everything. Not just, it's not just salvation from hell, it's salvation from works. We're delivered from all of this. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. And I want to make this statement because we're going to get to this in Romans, in the end of Romans. God still loves his Jewish people. Okay? They're his heart. For verse 17, for in it the righteousness, the plan, the justice, the holiness of God is revealed from faith to faith as is written, the just shall live by faith. Everything I've shared this morning is the righteousness of God. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time this morning. We thank you for this message. We thank you for the blessing of it. We, we praise you and exalt you, Lord God, for the, for the understanding. And I again ask God, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit, if there's anything I said this morning that's wrong, because I don't want to be misled. I don't want to mislead people. I don't want to stand before you one day and say, Jeff, you, you're, that sermon was heard by millions of people and it just led the church astray. Lord, please this morning, may the Holy Spirit take everything that is not of you and remove it from the, rem the memory of all of us, Lord God. And may the Holy Spirit take all of that is of you, the seeds that are planted and flourish them and, and make them into gigantic, fruitful trees in our lives. Lord, I just, I just know and bur what's burning in my heart, this just seems of you, Lord. So even here we put our faith in you that you will take your word and change us and bless us, Lord, and that you will be glorified in all of these things. In the holy name of Jesus we pray, amen and amen.